As the crisis at our southern border continues to be ignored by our country's leaders, the dangers of an ineffective immigration policy are growing. Chad Wolf, the founder and president of Wolf Global Advisors and former acting secretary of Homeland Security under President Trump knows a thing or two about immigration. He oversaw the world's largest law enforcement organization. Wolf is a nationally recognized expert in counterterrorism, law enforcement, border security, immigration, emergency management, critical infrastructure, and economic security. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Chad Wolf. So wake me up when it's all over. All right, how's everyone doing tonight? All right, good. Well, uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here at the Western Conservative Summit. Let me thank Jeff, Dr. Sweeting, Centennial Institute at uh, Colorado Christian University for the invitation really to be here tonight and share with you some of my thoughts about what's, uh, what's going on in the world and the country around us. My name is uh, Chad Wolf, and I was the former acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security under President Trump. And like many others, Like many others after 9-11, uh, or I would say like many others, 9-11 really forever changed the world around us. And so since that really, that faithful day, I've dedicated my career to solving some of the most pressing and most hard, or some of the hardest and most difficult homeland security issues that we have faced over the last 19 to 20 years. Today, the threats to the homeland are evolving and adapting to new environments and technologies. Now is the time to put public safety over politics and unfortunately, what we are seeing today out of the Biden administration is exactly the opposite. They have embarked on a radical agenda rather than promoting the policies that protect our country and that protect our homeland. And although I've spent my professional career in Washington, D.C., it's where I currently live today, I was raised in Texas, and quite frankly, I've tried to figure out how to get back there every day since. But during my time in Texas, my family and I spent a considerable amount of time visiting the great state of Colorado. And I can tell you that Texas and Colorado share a lot of similarities. First, we strongly believe in common sense values and beliefs. Faith, family, and country is what I was taught at an early age and in that order. And in today's world, these basic yet essential beliefs have kept me grounded, have pointed me and my moral compass due north some, against some very difficult and trying times. Second, we believe in hard work. There is simply no substitute. Both Coloradians and Texans have worked hard for what they have today, which includes the freedoms that we enjoy. We don't believe in government as a solution to meet all our needs. We believe in the sanctity of individual above all. Third, we believe in protecting our own through the right to bear arms, guaranteed to us by the Second Amendment. And lastly, and probably most importantly, we believe in freedom. Freedom from government overreach, freedom to exercise our faith, and freedom to raise our families as we see fit. I spent the last four years of the Trump administration working within and running the Department of Homeland Security. And these were some difficult times, to be sure. But I firmly believe it is precisely because of the work that we did every day at the department that helped cre uh, create conditions for our, free our freedoms to flourish. At the end of the day, we all want to feel safe in our communities, and we want our communities to flourish. We want a safe playground where our children can learn how to grow up. We want a government to work for us, not against us. We want to be able to teach our children our history, the good and the bad and not be told that we're racist for doing so. We want to stand up for our law enforcement. We proudly support our law enforcement, for they are the ones that put their lives at risk every day so that we enjoy the freedoms that we have. I say today more than ever, we need a government that reflects these core principles and puts everyday Americans ahead of special interests, foreign governments, and radical ideology that threatens this great experiment in freedom that we call the United States of America. Now, I get asked a lot what it was like to serve in the Trump administration, and would I do it again? And regardless of the audience, regardless of who asked me that question, the answer is the same each and every time. 
It was an honor of a lifetime to serve, and I did not hesitate when my country called to do so. Now, let's be clear. That's not to say that President Trump was not a difficult or hard boss. Let's, let's be clear about that, because he was, uh, but in a good way. He was fair, but probably most importantly, he pushed us at the department and challenged us uh, to not accept the conventional wisdom how things were done. And really, at the end of the day, I think that's really one of the things that made the administration so great, um, was to challenge that status quo. We also weren't afraid to stand really firm behind our policies, behind our principles, and the actions that we took. Because we knew at the end of the day we were doing so on the behalf of the American people. And even though the mainstream media won't tell you and won't cover the administration's accomplishments, they are important to remember and to reflect upon. Because they demonstrate that a conservative approach to the country's most difficult and challenging issues is the right approach. I think most rec uh, can recall historic tax cuts booming economy before COVID hit. When presented with a, a once in a century pandemic, the administration stepped up time and again. You recall targeted travel restrictions from China and other countries. You recall lo logistical PPE uh, being flown in from around the world for Americans. And perhaps most importantly, we have Operation Warp Speed to thank for some of the freedoms that we have and being able to gather here today. But we also have a completely reshaped federal judiciary, criminal justice reform, landmark peace accords in the Middle East, defeated ISIS caliphate, and securing our borders and protecting and, and standing firm for law enforcement. We all saw the benefit and the righteousness of each of these accomplishments. And for me, I was lucky enough to have a, a front row seat to many of these. So let's talk briefly about Homeland Security. Put simply, Homeland Security is national security, and no one understood that better than President Trump. And to look at what the department does any differently is really a disservice to the dedicated men and women of the department. And protecting the homeland is what we did and, and how we approached our job each and every day in the Trump administration. And honestly, it's very difficult and hard to tell what the current administration is doing to protect us. The American people want three simple things when it comes to homeland security. They want security at our border. They want a, uh, to us to fix a broken immigration system. And they want their family safe by upholding the rule of law. Let me just say, I, I saw firsthand leading DHS the assault on the heroes in blue that we had to endure over the last year and continue to, to this very day. We continue to remain at a very pivotal moment for law enforcement. And I, I know we heard Brandon talk a little bit about that earlier. From police to sheriffs to federal agents and other law enforcement officers, they combine, combine that, that thin blue line that protects our freedoms from chaos and anarchy. And either we are a nation of law and order or we are no nation at all. We have seen firsthand those that seek to destroy property in cities across America. These same groups calling to defund the police or abolish ICE. Their recklessness is only matched by their stupidity and hypocrisy. Over the last year, we've witnessed city after city first cut their police budgets, then experience, experience a rise in criminal behavior and activity, and then restore funding to their law enforcement. The leaders of these cities are sworn to preserve law and uphold order, but they have intentionally hamstrung their police forces out of misguided political convenience. They've allowed violent criminal opportunists to target courthouses, federal monuments, businesses, and police, fa uh, police facilities, the very symbols of American justice and prosperity. Some politician and leaders sought to criticize this violence, or sorry, characterize this violence as mostly peaceful. Our Constitution certainly protects the natural right to freedom of speech and peacefully assembly. But there is no constitutional right to loot, to burn, or to assault law enforcement officers or your fellow citizens. <laughs> I 
And when these leaders saw the error of their ways, they attempted, wrongly, to blame the Trump administration. But the American people saw through that. They saw through the political tactics, and the vast majority of the American people stand firmly with our law enforcement officers. Politics should never take precedence over public safety, and upholding the rule of law is essential to the maintenance of our peace and our prosperity. And now more than ever, we need to stand up and collectively support our nation's law enforcement in the face of unprecedented and unrighteous assault. Let me turn to border security, something I've talked uh, a lot about here recently. One of the most fundamental responsibilities of the President or the Secretary of Homeland Security is, is to enforce the sovereignty of our borders and to know exactly who is entering our country and for what purpose. The United States, the United States is, is the world's most generous and welcoming country, by far. But unfortunately, there are evil people in this world who seek to travel to this country with the intent on harming and killing Americans every single day. That's the reality, and we must be clear-eyed in that recognition. That is why, at the direction of President Trump, the department developed a data-driven process for evaluating information sharing and travel-related risk associated with each and every country across the world. We identified the lowest performing countries, those that shared no information with us. We put them on notice. And those that were unable or unwilling to meet our standards, we issued common sense travel restrictions. As a result, we began receiving more information from those countries than we have ever before in our history. <laughs> Unfortunately, President Biden in week one canceled this common sense counterterrorism tool. This administration took away any consequences for those countries that refused to provide necessary information to DHS officials needed to properly vet and screen individuals coming into the country today. Talking about our border, between 2017 and the beginning of the Trump administration all the way through 2019, we saw a record number of illegal aliens entering our country, largely for economic reasons. In 2019, during the last large crisis, we saw a total of a little over 900,000 illegal apprehensions along the southwest border, and that was an all-time high in 2019. And as startling as that number is, it pales into comparison what the Biden border crisis we're currently experiencing today. At the end of May of this fiscal year, we've got four more months of this fiscal year to go, we're already at over a 930 thousand illegal apprehensions. We're on track to have 1.3 to 1.5 million illegal apprehensions. Those are individuals coming across the southern border illegally, not at a port of entry. Think about that number for a minute. 1.3 to 1.5 million. That's the highest that we've seen in decades, over 21 years. And that is simply unprecedented and it's inexcusable. In FY20, so going back a year, Utilizing effective border security measures, we processed about 450,000. So last year, we processed less than a million more than they're going to process this year because of what some of the policies that we'll talk about here in a minute. We proved you can secure the border. You can bring integrity back to the immigration system. And during the Trump administration, we took decisive action across a range of issues. Let me just walk through a few of them. We effectively ended catch and release. That's a practice that refers to releasing illegal aliens into the community while they wait for their immigration proceedings to take place. That's a process that takes years. And we know that most of them never show up to their hearings. Once we ended this practice, word got out and the numbers dropped considerably. In FY20, again, going back a year, DHS released about 1,000 individuals. That number in 2019, before we took all those actions, we released about 230,000 aliens in the U.S. This year, in 2020, year's not over yet, we are going to see well north of that number. They are releasing minors and family units and single adults into American communities today, and it's irresponsible. 
we launched the Migrant Protection Protocols, which is a program often referred to as Remain in Mexico, which ensured that aliens seeking admission to the U.S. illegally and without proper documentation had to wait in Mexico for their immigration proceedings. We returned more than 70,000 illegal aliens to Mexico under this program. Mex and this was done in conjunction with the Mexican government. They were on board with it, and it proved successful. Why was it successful? It promoted a safe and more orderly process, discouraged individuals from making meritless asylum claims, and it enabled quick immigration results. At the same time, we let ICE law enforcement officers do their job and enforce the law. No longer did we direct, like the Obama administration it did, direct law enforcement officers to exempt any removable alien from laws. If you break our laws, you will be arrested, and we did remove you from the country. We negotiated and signed historic asylum cooperative agreements with our Northern Triangle partners. Rather than putting the lives, their lives in the hands of smugglers and criminal organizations, we worked with our foreign partners to develop a safe and more prosperous region. We completed four, over 450 miles of a, an effective border wall system. I'm sure you heard the president talk a little bit about that. Border, border Patrol agents, and look, I visited the border dozens of times. And the one thing I heard from Border Patrol agents time and time again, and they were clear and ambiguous about this, unambiguous, when it comes to effective border security, they need that infrastructure to do their job. They are overwhelmingly supportive of an effective border wall system, and the Trump administration delivered that to them. Now, we accomplished this feat uh, despite extreme opposition from Capitol Hill, the media, and the Washington elite. And wherever border wall systems have been constructed, the number of illegal, illegal, illegal border crossings and crime have gone down. The facts are the facts. These are just a few of the initiatives that we put in place really to drive border security and make the border more secure than we've ever seen. As I alluded to earlier, in just a matter of weeks after President Biden was inaugurated, they have effectively transformed a secure southwest border into an unmitigated disaster in the worst border crisis we have ever seen. Let's review a, a, just a couple of things that they've done. They've reinstituted catch and release. They have eliminated our migrant protection protocols or the Remain in Mexico program. They have directed law enforcement officers not to enforce the law. They have handcuffed them from removing those individuals that have no legal right to remain in the U.S. They canceled all of the international agreements that we forged with our foreign partners. And they stopped all construction on that border wall system. To me, it's pretty clear they've got Trump derangement syndrome in a very big way. Insofar as anything that we did, regardless if it was successful or not, it was subject to reverse, reversal, and they've reversed it. Really, at, you know, no matter if, if it was successful or whether their reversal harms Americans, which they are doing today. And I think a great case in point, which just happened about six or seven days ago, is a recent decision by the administration to cancel what we call the voice office. This is an office inside our Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. It was launched in 2017, the first year of the Trump administration, for American citizens to report crime that was allegedly committed by illegal aliens and also to facilitate federal resources and support to bringing criminals to justice. So they canceled that office. Instead, they utilized the resources of that office and transferred people over. Now their job is to make sure that illegal immigrants who say they are victims of crime get visas to remain here in the country. That's right, you heard that correctly. The closure of the voice office again demonstrates that this administration appears to be more interested in promoting illegal immigrants than about victims and families of American citizens. And I can tell you in as little as five months, the Biden administration has effectively abolished ICE in policy and has instituted an open border policy that threatens communities across the country. And I'll give you a little truth. The border crisis is 100% avoidable. 
The crisis has been self-inflicted by this administration at a time when we were dealing with a COVID crisis and an economic crisis. It didn't need to happen. They made dangerous decisions over the profound objections of career law enforcement professionals. But perhaps most alarming, the administration is lining the pockets of the Mexican cartels through their policies. No one benefits more from the crisis today than Mexican cartels. Every individual crossing that border, and again, 183,000 of them just last month, every single one of them pays upwards to $10,000 to a cartel member to cross that border. Cartels are making millions of dollars a day, not a month, not a week, a day, which in turn allows them to smuggle more immigrants, more migrants, and traffic more illegal narcotics across the border than we have ever seen before. And to be clear, they're not just smuggling individuals from Central America. They're helping to smuggle single adults from all over the world into the U.S. without detection. We also talk about gotaways. We also talk about a population of individuals that come across that border that we never encounter, that we don't have the resources to encounter. And that's usually between 25 and 35,000 a month. And that is, that's, that's the troubling part. We don't know who they are. We don't know if they're economic migrants. We don't know if they're terrorists, criminals, or who they are. This administration, unfortunately, is funding the largest human smuggling chain that we have ever witnessed. The amount of abuse, exploitation, rape, and other crimes committed against these migrants at the hands of cartels is staggering. Yet this administration continues to encourage migrants to make the journey, and it's unexcusable. During my time at DHS, because, because of the exploitation that we saw, any female coming across the border and into DHS custody over the age of 11, we gave a pregnancy test to. We knew that once they came into our care and custody, we had to provide, uh, provide that care. The Biden administration's inhumane immigration policy is fueling the crisis that we see on the border today. It's really that simple. Now, they've tried to blame the Trump administration. They've tried to blame COVID. They've even tried to blame hurricanes and earthquakes that took place about three to four years ago. But they've continued to be, they refuse to be honest with the American people and take ownership for the decisions that they've made. Had the policies from the last administration been left in place, CBP and ICE law enforcement would have been allowed to do their jobs according to their own expertise and judgment, and today there would be no border crisis. The American people deserve better. Immigration policy should benefit Americans in America, first and foremost. Instead, we see this administration continuing to put Americans last. So what are we doing about it? First. We must continue to talk about what's going on. Out of sight, out of mind is what the Main Street media and others want to see. We want to continue to highlight the dangers associated with the human trafficking and the smuggling chains operated by these cartels. We must continue to highlight these consequences of these policies. We must encourage states like Texas and Arizona to continue to take uh, action in challenging a lot of these changes in court. Over time, these actions will require the Biden administration to answer in a court of law. This administration's view of border security and immigration policy can be summed up with the following. Vice President Harris, it's time for you to visit the border. Yeah. Never has a lack of leadership been on display so visibly through the lack of action and messaging from the Vice President. The individual, again, who was put in charge of the crisis. Simply put, the Vice President, Vice President Harris is unqualified to address this national crisis. You know, to truly understand the crisis and to talk intelligently about the root causes of migration, which we've heard a lot about recently, one has to visit the border. You have to talk to the law enforcement officers there who are putting their lives on the, in danger every single day. You should actually talk to the migrants who are coming across that border. What's driving them? Is it economic reasons? Are they fleeing persecution? Do they want to reunite with their family? What's driving them at the end of the day? That's the root cause of migration. And you want to talk to the ranchers and the landowners and the others that are actually experiencing historic illegal immigration 
and the consequences that they're having to deal with. That's what she needs to be doing. Let me close by saying that at no time in our history has border security and immigration been so inextricably linked to national security. Decriminalizing illegal entry, stopping deportation of criminal aliens, resuming catch and release, returning to a broken asylum system, dismantling an effective border wall system, and walking away from landmark international agreements is not the way to secure the homeland. These are not just bad policies, they're dangerous ones. A system that puts criminals, illegal aliens, and foreign nationals first in Americans last is simply wrong. Let me, let me return to where I started. Effective homeland security is about creating the conditions for our freedoms to continue and to flourish. We need, a gov we need our government to return to policies that work, like those that we installed over the last four years, and not to abandon simply because of partisan politics. We need to return to the America First policies and priorities that we created over the last four years. And we need to acknowledge that there's nothing wrong with putting our nations and our citizens first. We need to stand firm in our belief that faith, family, and country should always dominate our political discourse. and We should never retreat from that proposition. And finally, we must stand unified in our belief that as bad as the current administration's policies may be today, we must never waver in our commitment to push back and to fight for our history, our liberty, and our values. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. May God bless you and God bless America. Goodness. So there's a lot there. There is a lot there. <laughs> Get Kamala to the border. Right. Uh, we're doing our best. I think she wants to go to Europe first, but uh, we're trying to get her there. Let's talk fentanyl. Yeah. Coming up through the border. Is that coming from China? It is. Yeah. It's, uh, it's coming from China. The precursors are coming from China. Um, you know, we saw it two to three years ago, maybe even going back four years ago, mainly coming through uh, mail, U.S. Postal, consignment mm -hmm. carriers. Uh, we started putting measures in place, and now we see a lot of it coming through Mexico. Um, we see um, the Mexican tar cartels starting to produce it on their own. So they're getting the precursors from China. They're starting to produce it on their own, and then we're seeing large amounts of it coming through that southwest border. Uh, CBP in the last month put out new numbers. They have apprehended more uh, drugs at this point in the fiscal year. Again, we got four months to go than they did all of last year. And we always say, you know, uh, you know, they're only capturing a small amount. So just think, historic, they're capturing historic loads. You can only imagine what's getting through. Um, so it's a, it's a real issue. It's a security issue, and it's, you know, something I talked about, right? It's, unfortunately, it, the crisis that we're seeing today is fueling these cartels, and it's giving them more opportunities and more resources to make more drugs and smuggle more narcotics across that border. Are we on a direct path to chaos right here with these policies? I mean, it is. It's not good. Uh, you've got defunding the police. Yeah. You've got open borders. You've got drug cartels coming in. What's the end game here for the left? What, what are they trying to achieve? So it's tough. I get asked that, I get asked that question a lot. Do they actually mean to do this? And, and the answer is yes, uh, because we saw them campaign on it. We saw them talk about it during the transition, and then Inauguration Day hit, and they, you know, they rescinded four or five policies right out of the, the chute. So there was a plan. Was it a good plan? No. Do they believe, you know, I think they cut, were caught by surprise on the reaction uh, that we see at the border today, which really started in February. Um, so I think they are caught a little flat-footed. Uh, but I think there's some fundamental differences between, you know, a Republican administration, Trump administration, and, and the folks there today. They don't believe in immigration enforcement. Right. They simply don't believe in it. Uh, they don't, uh, they want to abolish ICE. They don't want to let law enforcement do their job at the end of the day. And my retort, because I would talk to a lot of um, members of Congress, um, folks that weren't big fans of the Trump administration, and they would, they would ask me to not do certain things. And what I would tell them every day is, that's not my job. My job is to enforce the law that Congress writes. Right. If you don't want me to do that, you need to change the law. But they know they can't. They don't have the consensus to do that. So they're going to lean on the executive branch to change the law, and that's what they're doing today. Do you think their end goal is amnesty? 
To a certain extent, yes. I mean, you know, we talk about DACA, the DACA population, right? right? So that's about nine going on 10 years old. Uh, my fear is in five to six years, you'll talk about an amnesty program for the millions that came in in 2021. You'll be talking about that in five to six years. That's their goal. They'll, they'll continue to do that. We're seeing children abandoned at the border. Yeah. I mean, I remember, it wasn't that long ago, when uh, AOC is down <laughs> against a fence crying because there are kids being separated from their families yeah. and stuff like that. It seems like that's all gone away, even uh, though yeah. it seems like it's just as worse, if not. It, oh, it's, it's much worse. Much worse. It's much worse. Right. Uh, you know, AOC is interesting. So, yes, she was down there, I believe, in 2019, um, hanging on the fence. She was in a Border Patrol facility. We couldn't get her out. She spent like three and a half hours there. We we're like, it's time to leave. We could not get her to leave. Guess how many times she's been down to the border? Since then? Zero. Zero. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all Because it's, it's all politics. If she wow. really cares about the people wow. and the children, then, you know, at the height of, the, in 2019, under, under the Trump administration, when you talk about separating families and you talk about children, at the height of it, we had in custody about 2,600. Hmm. Uh, at the height, and they still have a number, they have 20,000 in custody. Wow. Ten times. More. Ten times. And you talk about separating families. We know because Border Patrol interviews many of these families that come across because of the policies of the Biden administration, families are separating themselves before they get to that border because they know their child has a better chance to stay here if they go across that border by themselves than with a family. Mm. So when you talk about separating families, I would say that the Biden administration, because of the policy they have pursued, are separating hundreds a day um, from their parents because, they, because of the, the, the policies that they've pursued. Wow. What's the threat of radical Islam to the homeland right now? Well, yeah, uh, it, it's morphed over time. Yeah. Um, I would say certainly uh, over the last 19 years, you know, the threat of foreign terrorist organizations uh, ha has been diminished for a couple of different reasons. One, because we have been very successful in theater, mm. uh, the U.S. military has. Um, and we have diminished their capabilities of actually striking the homeland. But what that has caused is a rise in what we call domestic extremism. We, these are individuals here in the U.S. that can be radicalized over the internet. Hmm. They don't have to travel to Syria. They don't have to travel to the battlefield. It can just go online and become radicalized to violence. Uh, and that's the concerning thing, because that can happen very quickly, and law enforcement doesn't get a lot of heads up for that. Hmm. Um, you know, that's different than what this administration will want you to believe, which is white supremacy. The president actually said this, that white supremacy is the biggest terror threat to the United States. I can't tell you how big of a lie that is. Really? Wow. Um, because, I mean, I, we put out threat assessments at the department. It's just, it's not true. Yeah. You know, when you look at cybersecurity, when you look at foreign terrorist organizations, and all these different threats facing right. the homeland, look, we got to be concerned about it, but it's not the top threat. It's not by far. Yeah. Uh, but again, I think politics is driving um, certain messaging that they're trying to do at the end of the day. Wow. Wow. Uh, cyber attacks, ransomware, yeah. going after meatpacking here in Colorado, yeah. going after pipelines on the East Coast. Is this administration prepared to protect the homeland? Well, they need to be. Uh, they yeah. certainly need to be. I think they, they're starting to understand what it's going to take. I think the increase in ransomware that we saw from Colonial Pipeline to JBS, and I'm sure there will be others, the federal government's got to do more. Uh, and I'm an advocate for taking the gloves off and having all elements of the federal government. That includes our intelligence community, that includes DOD, Cyber Command, National Security Agency, and others going after whether it's a state actor or a non-state actor. We've got to hold these folks accountable and apply consequences, Other it's going to, otherwise it's going to continue to proliferate and we're going to continue to see these attacks day after day. So uh, hopefully the Biden administration, you know, again, uh, my guess is that this came up uh, between President Biden and President Putin. Uh, some of these folks are operating out of Russia. We'll see how hard and, you know, th there's, there's a leadership vacuum there that's got to be filled at the end of the day. So the administration needs to do more um, because I think the world is watching. I think cyber criminals are watching to see what is the reaction of the United States. President Biden raises the idea that uh, white supremacy is the single yep. greatest threat that we're facing. They seem to ignore entirely threats from the left. 
uh, Antifa, uh, BLM, right. Right. the destruction of these yeah. cities. Is, that, is, is it all political? Because as you mentioned, that's a lie. Yeah. It's not the greatest threat. Yeah. How serious is the radical left? Well, look, I lived through it uh, last summer specifically, right, right? Uh, in Portland where DHS was heavily involved and in, in other cities across the country. What we saw there is, you know, anarchists and violent opportunists uh, attacking uh, federal facilities, law enforcement and the left. And you saw almost no one on the left talk mm -hmm. about it. Right. Right. But January 6 hits and then it's, you know, it's from, it's all they can talk about. Right. And all I, you know, my big push is make, you know, violence is violence. And whether you're attacking law enforcement, a federal facility, we need to treat everyone the same. So if we are prosecuting individuals for January 6th, we need to be prosecuting people that injured over 300 law enforcement officers in Portland. Right. Instead, <laughs> instead, we see them arrested and released the very next day right. because it's too difficult to prosecute that many people. Well, it's not because they're, they're doing it in DC. Um, so this is about priorities. This is about making sure that, you know, the FBI, uh, they can do this job. They have to reallocate resources to do that. And I think that's the disappointing part because, um, you know, it was just a short period of time when you know, that happened in Portland in, in January the 6th. And you can't see two more different reactions right. to how they're being handled. And people will talk about how, you know, the events of the 6th are very different because it's the U.S. Capitol. Like, I understand that uh, conceptually, but being on the ground in Portland and I visited there, y you know, you're defending a courthouse. You're defending that seat of justice right. in Portland. And to have uh, IEDs thrown at law enforcement officers, to have baseball bats, uh, they're hit in the head with baseball bats, wow. lasers in their eyes, they have permanent eye damage. To have all of that and not to have a consequence and, um, to have those folks, almost no one arrested, and if they are arrested, very few have actually been charged, hmm. um, is very, very disappointing. Final question for you this evening. Uh, when you look up Chad Wolf on Google, Google sometimes oh, uh, finishes your sentence with the most popular phrase often searched for you. Oh, I can only imagine. Yeah, the most popular is Chad Wolf handsome. <laughs> Uh, who is the best looking member of, the president's, of President Trump's cabinet? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a tough one. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to take a pass on that. Uh, <laughs> it might be Chad I don't know. Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think Google apparently thinks yeah. so. Friends, let's give Chad Wolf, the Honorable Chad Wolf, a round of applause. Thank you, Thank you. so much Appreciate for your work. It. Thank you for your patriotism. God bless you. You, you did great.